In the harvest ritual of the Jewish nation, the first fruits of the harvest are consecrated to God, so that the whole harvest may be received as a gift from God. Now we receive the first fruits of salvation as a pledge that one day we're going to be given by God salvation, complete salvation. And until that happens, of course, we ourselves are groaning and waiting patiently and moving towards that glorious time of our own salvation and final liberation. Moving now to verses 26 to 30. We turn to the Spirit who helps us within the depths of our own hearts. And in this uh, beautiful section, God is called the Searcher of Hearts. The Searcher of Hearts. A name we find in Scripture. For example, when Samuel goes in search of the successor, he's going to anoint somebody to succeed Saul, who's fallen out of favor with God. He asks Jesse to, I want to have a look at all his sons. And for one of them, he says, take no notice of his appearance or height. This is God saying to Samuel, for I have rejected him. God does not see as man sees. Man looks at appearances, but God looks at the heart. In Psalm uh, 17, verse 3, You search my heart, O Lord. You visit me by night. You test me and find in me no wrong. God can see deeply into who I am and what I want and what I truly desire. And the very famous, the beginning of that beautiful, uh, famous Psalm 139, the very beginning of it says, O Lord, you search me and you know me. You know everything about me. Before even a word is on my lips, you know it all. So, God knows us more intimately than we know ourselves. He knows our needs better than we do. And that's why, Paul says in verse 26, when we can't choose words in order to pray properly, the Spirit himself expresses our plea in a way that can't be put into words. Now, isn't that a most beautiful thing? Don't we feel God's love for us in that phrase? We believe through baptism that our bodies truly are the living temples of the Spirit and that this Spirit is continuously praying within us. We just tap into that prayer as best we can. We're living temples of the Spirit. Contemplatives are aware of this truth. By stilling their minds and hearts, they become aware of the God within, and they enter into deep communion, union, communion, with this mystery. So there's no distinction between them and God. It's all one. It's all one. And the church has a deep sense of this too. When we pray the prayer of the church, we're joining into the ceaseless prayer of Jesus, High Priest, praying in us and praying in the heart of every living creature. We shouldn't try to distinguish, incidentally, between the ceaseless prayer of the Spirit and the ceaseless prayer of Jesus, because it's the one mystery of the divine within us. We know that by turning everything to their good, God cooperates with all those who love him. This is magnificent stuff, isn't it? Or as another translation has it, all things come together for those who love God. I think this touches the very heart of our faith. 
no matter what's happening to us, around us, we trust that it will all turn out for the best in the long run. I remember when I was a young kid, this is something my mother always said to me. Her faith in God's providence was just so central to the way she saw life. And it's this strong sense that God will bring us through whatever's difficult now if we try to remain faithful and loving. And then, of course, we'll be able to say with Juliana of Norwich, you know, everything's fine. Everything's truly fine. It's all worked out for the best. And then the rest of these verses. Those he called, the ones he chose, those who share in the image of his Son, those who are justified, those who are glorified, they sort of give us a glimpse of God's extraordinary plan for human beings and for us especially. We are continually being shaped and transformed by God through the events of our life. God's plan of salvation is unfolding through the lives of each one of us. We are part of that plan which leads eventually, of course, to glory. Not our glory, of course, but our sharing in the glory of God. Now we come to the final uh, section, the third section, verses 31 to 39, a hymn to God's love. This is thrilling, isn't it? This, these extraordinary verses, this climax to this great chapter, and in the words of Bishop Tom Wright again, these verses deserve to be written in letters of fire on the living tablets of our hearts. With God on our side, who can be against us? Well, of course, this is a magnificent phrase for how we approach life. God's on our side, of course God is. Therefore, have no fear. And we understand totally, don't we, that the opposite of faith is fear. So we have faith because God's on our side. But the context of this is not just how we approach life, but the very context of what Paul is, is uh, talking about here is the last judgments. And he's saying that God's not going to judge us because... God didn't spare his own son, but he gave him up to benefit us all. So if God's like that, he's not going to judge you and me. Now isn't that moving? God giving us his son, entrusting his son to us, to each one of us. Father Brendan Byrne makes this very moving comment. Nowhere else does Paul state the vulnerability of God, the vulnerability to which God exposed himself so poignantly is here. So God's not going to condemn us, neither will Jesus. He, be, he not only died for us, Jesus, he rose from the dead. And there at God's right hand, he stands and pleads for us. What an extraordinary picture of Jesus at the Last Judgment. A little bit different from the Last Judgment scene that we're so familiar with in St. Matthew, where the Son of Man comes as judge. Here, Jesus is pictured, imagined as praying for us, interceding for us, not as judging us. This image of Jesus constantly and continually at God's side praying for us, for you and for me, is a very powerful image. We find it in the letter to the Hebrews. His power to save is utterly certain since he is living forever to intercede for all who come to God through him. Chapter 7, verse 25. And again in Hebrews... Christ has entered heaven itself so that he could appear 